So there's also a, an option that you can, um, where you can click and it says install dependencies. It's always easier to click that, you know, check it off because then you, will, you don't have to worry, you would install all the packages that are required by that package. So once you've done that, you should be able to type library sum r and it should not give you an error. Maybe it will give you something like a loading library input uh, because it needs it. Uh, for me, it's already loaded because I've loaded some R before, so it doesn't give me the message anymore. Okay, everyone? Still waiting for it to download or waiting for someone to come see you? Okay. It's all right. If you, if you haven't managed to download it, you can stay here for lunch and uh, have a couple of hours to do it. When you load the package, it will it, it will give you an error if, if something's missing. Mm -hmm. Is it precisely the package? Like how many variables? So in, when you load the package, it will contain all the functions, all the data that are needed, uh, all the instructions. So it's just like a, just just like R, but it's a smaller version that only contains what you need. Yes? You could, but you need to you need to download the source code, which is of course available because it's free, right? So you can download the source and you can edit any of the files, you can change it, you can modify it to suit your needs. Of course you need to know a little bit more to do that, but it's fairly easy. There's a lot of documentation on how to do it. Uh, so in my group we've got we've created, you know, dozens of packages that are available and things. Uh, and it's very easy to do. So you can edit the packages? Yeah, you can it's it's all, all of it is open source, open access. You can you can yeah, so when you download the package, it's going to download the binary for your computer. Like for Windows, it downloads the binary and things. But the places where it gets the package, there's always the, the source code, and you can download the source code and, and look at the code and do everything. Yeah, it will give you the instructions, but you won't look, I mean, you, well, it, you, can, you can look at the source of R, but you won't get all the details. Because it's hiding some things from you, because you don't need to see them. Okay, so we're just going to take a few minutes to uh, just talk a little bit about uh, our programming. Um, so I wanted to say that R is a true programming language. So even though we haven't looked at that yet, so you have if statements, you've got uh, for and while loops, just like any programming language. Um, and I think it's a good time to take a break because this will probably take too long and we'll uh, look at that after lunch. And we don't have too much on the R basics uh, after that, so we'll be able to move on very quickly onto the exploratory data analysis, which will be slightly more interesting because we'll look at a few things and you'll see the power of R very quickly. Any questions before uh, we go for lunch? Okay, so we're going to start again. Before we start, is there any questions? So I know this morning's been a bit slow, you know, we're going slowly through all the things. Um, we're going to finish that, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the R uh, programming language, and then we're going to move on into application, exploratory data analysis, we're going to see some real data sets, how to visualize these things and so forth. So hopefully there will be more interaction afterwards. Okay. <clears throat> You're late, Francis. Uh, so we've seen we've <laughs> so we've seen the basics of um, the the R language, but in fact R is really a full programming uh, software. So this means that you can write your own functions to do things that are not really available in R. So let's say you've got a special data set that you want to do something that's very particular for that data set that is not built into R. Well, you can go ahead and write your own function to do it. 
not only you can write your own script, but then you can create functions that you can reuse in the future that will be adapted to various things. So uh, this is what I mean by a true programming language. So <clears throat> one of the first things you use in, in programming is called the if statement. So typically you will have executions and things that depend on what uh, what the variable is or um, the value of the variable and so forth. So it's very important to have this if statement that will be sort of conditional on something else. So here's an example. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I went back. So I've, I've coded something very simple here. If you look at this, <clears throat> what do you think this is doing? Well, it's saying if x is greater than 0, print x else print minus x. What do you think this is doing? Absolute value. Absolute value, right? Because if x is positive, then you just print x. If it's negative, you take the negative sign of that, which would be positive, right? So when you take the absolute value of x in R, this is just what it's doing. It's just looking at the value of x. If it's greater than 0, it just returns that. If it's not, it returns the negative of it. Okay? So let's look at that example. x is minus 2. Okay? And we're going to do this little exercise to do that. <coughs> Since it's minus 2, the absolute value is 2, and therefore it's printing 2. Okay? So you need this sort of, of if statements in order to know what to do depending on the value you're looking at. <clears throat> you can have if and else if statements. So it could be if x is greater than 0, otherwise if it's 0, and then else something else. So you could have different cases that you can play with. Okay, So you can divide it and put as many else health as you want. So you could have if. Uh, x is greater than 0, if it's 1, if it's 2, and then you could have different cases of things. So this is, the, this is the exact same thing, right? But if x is 0, then we know it's just 0. It's just to show you an example. <clears throat> Another thing that's very uh, important when you do uh, programming, so what is the goal of programming? Is to let the computer do things that either you couldn't do by hand or would take too long, or needs to be repeated many times so that the computer can do that very easily, right? right? By hand, we can do it, but it's going to take us a long time to repeat an addition on a million numbers, for example, right? But for the computer, it's very easy. And in order to do things automatically and repeat things, we need what we call for or wide loops. So this will just try to <coughs> uh, repeat something many, many times or uh, on a vector or something like that. So let's look at an example to understand. So let's say n here is uh, a million. Okay. What we're going to do with the second comment, and we're going to see sad next. So I'm not going to um, to expand that uh, in great details. But basically, what this does is that it will generate uh, n random numbers from a normal distribution with mean 10 and standard deviation 1. So this is just a way to generate some random numbers. <clears throat> and I'm not going to show x because there's a million number, but we can look at the first 10 numbers. Okay, So you can see that it's close to 10 because the mean is 10. But of course, there's some noise. There's some variability because the sound deviation is 1. R is vectorized, so we know that we can take the square of x, and what this will do is that it will apply the square function to each element of the vector x. This is what we've seen earlier. Another way to do it will, will be to say, okay, we've got a vector, so why don't we loop for each element of x, I'm going to take the square, and I'm going to assign that to a value of my vector. So what I can do is that... <clears throat> I can generate a vector of 0 of length n, that is a million. This is just a vector of 0. Okay, The length of y is just n, which is a million. Okay, And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to loop over all the elements of x, and every time I have a new value, I take the square, and I'm going to put it into the vector y. 
So this is what you do with a for loop. So this says for each i going from 1 to n, I'm going to replace the value of the eth element of the ith element of y with the square root of x of i. Okay? So this is um, so here I wanted to do the square. Sorry. Doesn't really matter. It's just an example. Okay? And we're going to take the square of that. <coughs> so this is going to do exactly the same thing. Okay, and if you look at y from 1 to 10, <coughs> it's going to be the square of each of the values. Okay, is it clear what this uh, statement is doing? Okay, just for each i in 1 to n, you're going to do that. Okay, so this is slightly more advanced, don't worry too much, we're not going to play with programming too much, but I wanted to show you that R is a fully uh, uh, programming language, you can, you, and you can do your own scripts and things. Hopefully, um, soon enough, you know, once you'll play with R, you will have more experience with it, you will be able to write little scripts that can do things for you in a more efficient way. But one thing that I wanted to bring up <coughs> is that so I said you could do it this way. You can take y and you take the square of x. It's vectorized. Or we could do it, you know, almost manually, tell the computer exactly what to do, loop over all the element, and say for each element, take the square of it. So what's the difference? That's a lot slower, right? So if we loop over all the elements, and it's going to be very slow compared to do the operation in the vector. Well, you need you don't have to initialize, but you need to uh, tell him how big y will be. Because if you don't do that, you won't know that y is a vector. In fact, you won't even know what y is. So you need to specify y before. And in fact, the way you do that in R, you need to initialize. Because when you create a vector, it will always be initialized. So the, the actual value of y, so here I could have put 1, for example, or minus 10 or whatever, it wouldn't really matter because I will just overwrite that. But what I need is to create a vector of length n. Okay? So the point of this exercise, as you can see, it's, it's very challenging and intellectually it's very interesting. But it's really to show you that if you do a full loop, it's going to be a lot slower than just doing x squared. Right? It's because R is vectorized, so one of the default of R is that it can be slightly slow sometimes. Um, and in order to be efficient, you need to work with vectors. Okay? Do things on vectors directly. Do not loop over all the elements because it's slower. Because R, the way R was designed, if you, tell him a, if you give him a vector and you say this is going to be an operation on the vector, is going to be a lot more efficient because it's going to know what to do a lot more uh, efficiently. So this is just uh, for you to uh, tell you to be a little bit careful about these loops that can be very slow in R. Another way to do a loop is with what we call the while loop. So for the for loop, we tell him exactly from which uh, element to which element we go, and we're going to loop for each i from 1 to n. But we could just do, we could loop until a condition is satisfied and here we could have a counter that say we start in one until it less what we call an n which is going to loop and do the same thing and we're going to take the square root or let's say the square here to be consistent we're going to take the square of that element and once you've done it you increase the counter and then you keep on going until you are less than what we call an n so it's the exact same thing, it will give you the exact same answer, but it's just it's a different way to do it. And it's also a different way to do things because you can have uh, conditional statements depending on other values and so forth. So I will, I will show you a more advanced example of that later on. Is this sort of clear what the idea of, of this is? So what's the function counter? Counter is just is just counting where you are. So you're looping over the vector. You start at one, then you say, okay, if it's counter, it's less or equal than n. I'm going to increase the counter and I'm going to take this. 
you just increase it until you've done it for the n elements. Okay. <clears throat> So we've done that just to show you that you can do lots of things. You can script, you can loop over things. Uh, so for example, you can ap apply the square root to uh, a vector x. And when you compare the execution speed, it's going to be a lot faster when you do it on the vector directly. So as I said, you can also create your own function. So when we looked at the absolute value of x, right, we've got the if x is positive, return x, else return minus x. It would be nice to write a function that would do that. In fact, there's one in R, it's called apps for absolute value. But you can create your own function to do things so that every time you're going to apply that function to a new value, you don't have to recopy everything, right? You can just apply that function to that value. So here's a nice, a very nice function that I'm sure you're going to use a lot. It's called my first function, and it takes a few arguments. So the first one is your name which is a character. First one is my name, and there's a default value. And then there's a number, and depending on the number, what it will do, if number is zero, it will return your name, else it will return my name. It's a great function. I decided to write a package, and I'm going to submit it to R. So, OK, so we're going to copy and paste that function. <coughs> OK. And then R knows it's a function, so it's going to be like the other functions we, we use in R. You can just apply that to um, <coughs> the variables you have. So here, you know, your name is Francis. Number is 1. So we're going to try that. Because number was 1, it's going to speed up my name. If you try 0, OK, it's Francis. If you use something else. That's going to output that name. So the beauty of a function is that you don't have to recopy and paste the function every time you're using it. You can just modify the arguments that you want. Also, something I wanted to show you is that when you write a function, you can have variables that have defaults. Like this one has a default of Raphael, and this one, this one has a default of 0. So you don't have to specify these two if you don't want to. OK? Here's a more advanced example up here. Okay. And I uh, call that function uh, my square root. <clears throat> so if we apply that to 81, it's 9, and so forth. Okay. So <clears throat> what is this function doing? It's actually computing the square root of a number using an algorithm called newton raphson So I'm not going to go into the details, but in fact, this is exactly what R uses to compute the square root of a number. Because there's no magic, magic formula for the square root of a number, right? You know it by hand, for, uh, by hand for some numbers, or you can do some calculation, but you cannot just guess the square root of numbers. It's not like doing an addition or multiplication, right? So you need something that will be able to know, well, the square root of a number is that if I square that number, I'll obtain the number you gave me. But you can actually do something that will try to calculate numerically the square root of a number, and this is one way to do it. So in R, there's a function that does it, and someone has cut it what I cut it just right here. Okay. Of course, it's a bit more efficient, and it's better in R, but it's just to show you an example that we can do very fancy things with, with uh, functions. Lines with the brackets. You can put everything in the same line, right? Say that again? You have changes of lines and you put a bracket and a change of line, but you could put all of the, all the scripts into one line. Oh, so you're asking if, if I could do this, for example? No, 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 the, for the script, the, for the actual yeah. functions? Yeah. But when, when you have to change of line after a bracket, yes. or, can you? Put everything in the same line? You, you, you could, but there's a couple of reasons why you shouldn't do that. The first one is that because it's going to be very hard to read any code if you put everything on the same line, right? You can have a line with a billion characters. Uh, so it's not uh, very pretty to look at, especially when you write a lot of code. You need to be very careful about the sort of things you do 
Uh, typically, you also need to indent your code to make it easy so that you know there's uh, a jump every time there's a new uh, uh, a new thing you want to do. Um, but you could, but you have to be a little bit careful. So, for example, this one, um, you could do X and add something else here. If you want to put it on the same line, you need to put a semicolon here. So, it's better to put each uh, operation on a separate line. Yeah. So, can you save continuity, please, on the screen? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a good question. So, typically, you, it depends, right? If you want to, if you use it a lot, what you would want is that every time you load R, you will know your functions, right? So what you could do is that you could create a new script. Okay, let's say I'm gonna create a new one here. You don't have to do that, it's just to show you. Okay, and I'm gonna call that one uh, test.r. And I'm gonna put it on my desktop. Okay, then it contains my function. Then what I can do is that I can, what we call, source the file. So it will actually execute everything that's in the file so that I don't have to copy and paste, it will know the functions. Still, this is not really a nice way to do it because every time you're gonna have to source your, the file. The best way to do it will be to create your own package that contains the function. You just type library, my functions, or whatever you call it, and then every time you load the library, it will know the functions you use. And this is a very efficient way to do things. Of course, sometimes I just test a few things. And typically when I do that, I just have my script. I put all my functions at the top, the bottom. I copy them before, and then I, I execute what I want. OK? So when you just test some functions, just need something very quickly, I just write it somewhere in my script. I just copy and paste it, and then R knows it. I don't need to input that, that function anymore until I quit R and I relaunch R the, the next time. But in general, once you, you're starting to, to be very comfortable with R, it would be better to try to create your own library that you can load every time you need it. You still do have to call the library, right? Yes. But at least you don't have to copy and paste all the functions. Everything is, is uh, loaded when you type library. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's the of the the Say that again. You mean, is it like global or local? Is that? Okay. So the question is, let's say in my function here, I create a variable. Actually, let's try that. Okay. I assign a variable in my function. You can, you can try the same. So copy and paste that. And then I'm going to execute that function. <coughs> And you would think that because I assigned the value 3 to y, then now y should be 3. It's not. Okay? The reason is because I assigned the variable within the function. And this is what we call a local assignment. So it's only going to be known in the environment in which you do the assignment. If you want to do a global assignment, that is something that's going to be known in R everywhere you're working, you can do like this. So you put two, uh, uh, two less signs like that. And this will be a global assignment. And this will be known in R everywhere. But this is a really bad idea. You should never do that because global assignments can be very, very tricky. Uh, because then you will think that you've got a variable everywhere, but then if you reassign a value, you won't know it anymore. So it's, it's typically uh, a bad idea never do global assignments. So forgot I just said that. You cannot do it. OK? OK, so we've seen how to create um, a function. <coughs> um, oh, yeah, there's. Yeah, go ahead. There are certain function names that are locked out because you don't want to override a function that's already uh, That's a good question, but I think they might be actually. Let's let's try. So you you can um, you can lock some variables. So typically global yes, public. typically global variables 
that are part of R will be locked out. That is, you can override these variables. Uh, and in fact, you can even do that yourself. When you do create a variable, you can also lock it so that no one can modify the variable. But again, that's a really bad idea to do. I mean, it's, it's good for R because there's the core variables. But let's say, so there's the absolute value function, right? Uh, and here we had, so I could do that, for example. Could try to reassign absolute value to that function. And we'll see what it's going to say. Okay, it didn't give me, it didn't like, oh. Actually, here was a bad choice because there's already the absolute value here. So, but it's uh, apparently you can do it, but it's a bad idea to do it. So, I should have tried something else. Actually, let's try that. Yeah. So we uh, this should be signed. Yeah, even still here, it doesn't really like it. So I guess it, it, it's probably going to give you an error if you try to do that. OK, so we've seen how to write functions. Why don't you try to write a function? Um, and you can call it whatever you want that will create, um, that will compute the inverse of a value x. So that your function should take one uh, input value, which is x, and it should return the inverse of x. Very, very difficult function to write. So try to do that. So just follow the, the, the template that you have. <coughs> Take x, compute the inverse, and, and return that. I'm going to help you a bit. So this is what it should look like. So let's go to my inverse. Should take a value x and it should return so it should do something inside. Try to think about it. What you could do is, okay, let's create a new variable 1 over x, and then I return that value y. If you really want to be explicit, you could type return y. Well, you just write return 1 over x. You, you, you could do that, but it's just I wanted to make it more explicit just okay, to show. Yeah, yeah, you can, exactly. But just in general, you, you know, you would want to make um, uh, some temporary assignments and then return that at the end. Okay, so this should work, and of course we'll return the inverse of x because you're just doing one over x. Yeah, so now we're going to try to check whether x is zero or not. So we're going to use because dividing by zero is kind of a bad idea, right? In fact, R knows how to, how to deal with it. If you divide by zero, you will know that you know the limit is infinity, and you will know how to deal with it. Okay? But here we're going to do something like, okay, if x is uh, 0, we're going we're gonna to print a warning. Okay? And otherwise, we're going to say it's fine, and we can just return that. Okay, so this will test if x is 0. If it is, it will print, are you crazy? And otherwise, it will just return the value. OK, 
Okay, and this is your function and it works fine. Any questions? Exactly. Any number. I just want to make a special check if if it is zero. I'm going to say hey, be careful because you can divide by zero. But what happens for some reason the variable x that I input in is x itself doesn't doesn't matter. I mean, I, I, what is x? I think in a series of letters rather than numbers. Okay. Okay, that's a, it's okay. So that's a good question. What if you input something that's not a number, right? For example, like a character. Well, you're going to be in trouble because you don't know what to do if it's a character, and it's, you're probably going to get an error. In fact, you can try. <clears throat> so something like that, right? It's going to tell you it's not numeric, so I don't know how to compute the the inverse of it, okay? So something I should say is that <clears throat> one uh, good thing about R is that it's what we call object-oriented. So you can define what we call class and methods. So a method is a p particular kind of function that will know what to do depending, depending on the, the kind of object you input. So you could define various functions, whether you've got a character, whether it's zero, whether it's positive, whether it's a matrix, whether it's a vector, and then depend, depending on the type of the input, the function would know what to do. Basically, you would have sub-functions for each of, these, each of these different cases, and then uh, the function will know which one to use at which time. So this is the beauty of R. It's that it's object-oriented, so you can do some very nice and easy programming that will take up all these special cases for you. For example, uh, if you plot, <coughs> um, let me give you an example. <coughs> Well, we'll see an example of that later when we look at the summary function. Okay, so we know how to write a function. We've looked at um, <clears throat> that more advanced function, which is uh, computing the square root. 